să respectăm programul. So, primul vorbitor trebuia să fie preasfântul Părinte Emilian Crișanu, dar din motive binecuvântate nu poate fi și va vorbi în locul dânsului Părinte Nicolae. Titlul anunțat al preasfântului Părinte Episcopicar Emilian Crișanu este Cunoașterea Teologiei Creștine, Calea către Dumnezeu și Oameni, Cunoașterea Teologiei Creștine, Calea către Dumnezeu și Oameni. Vă rugăm, Părinte, să expune. Părinte profesor, Mulțumesc, părinte este profesor. Părinte profesor care predă patologie cu studii de doctorat la Atena și am fost și eu foarte bucuros să-l întâlnesc astăzi. Vă rugăm frumos. Mulțumesc. Mulțumesc, Părinte profesor. Onorat prezidiu, onorat auditoriu, preasfințitul Părinte Emilian, din motive obiective a trebuit să părăsească orașul și m-a însărcinat pe mine să citesc textul în rezumat al lucrării preasfinției sale intitulat așa, după cum spunea Părintele Profesor, Cunoașterea teologiei creștine, cale către Dumnezeu și oameni. Cunoașterea Sfintei Scripturi și a Sfintei Tradiții sunt două căi autentice care ne îndreaptă către Sfânta Trăime, dar și către Fiul lui Dumnezeu cel adevărat. Întrupat de la Duhul Sfânt și Fecioara Maria, devenind om, pentru mântuirea oamenilor în persoana lui Isus Hristos. Cunoașterea învățăturii ce se desprinde din Biblie și scrierile Sfinților Părinții ai Bisericii ne focusează atenția către Dumnezeu în legătură de iubire față de creație și în special față de om. Aceasta este viața veșnică, Nu se aude. În engleză. Reluăm. Aceasta este viața veșnică, să te cunoască pe tine singurul adevăratul Dumnezeu și pe Isus Hristos pe care l-ai trimis. Ioan 17 cu 3. Dă-i altul, omule. Paragraful al treilea suntem. Problema cunoașterii teologiei creștine reflectă informarea noastră. Ce știm despre Dumnezeu? Dar și formarea noastră, ce credem despre Dumnezeu? Acestea au la bază îndemnul Mântuitorului Iisus Hristos. Cereți și vi se va da, căutați și veți afla, Bateți și vi se va deschide, că oricine cere ea, cel care caută află, iar celui care bate îi se va deschide. Matei 7, cu 7 până la 8. Teologia creștin-ortodoxă ne învață despre cunoașterea lui Dumnezeu prin revelația naturală. Cerurile spun slava lui Dumnezeu și facerea mâinilor lui o vestește tăria. Psalmul 18 cu 1 și revelația supranaturală. După ce Dumnezeu odinioară în multe rânduri și în multe chipuri, a grei prin proroci, în zilele cele mai de pe urmă ne-a grei nouă prin Fiul, pe care l-a pus moștenitor a toate și prin care a făcut și viacurile. Evrei 1 cu 1 până la 2. Raportul dintre cunoașterea naturală și cea supranaturală este văzută de Sfântul Isaac Sirul 
ca două etape succesive pe calea ce o străbate omul pentru a ajunge la contemplarea lui Dumnezeu. Există o cunoaștere care premerge credinței și o cunoaștere care se naște din credință. Desigur că în procesul cunoașterii teologiei, pentru a ajunge la Dumnezeu este nevoie de credință și har, de iubire a omului care duce la comuniunea interpersonală cu Dumnezeu. Acum însă, că ați cunoscut pe Dumnezeu, sau mai degrabă ați fost cunoscuți de Dumnezeu, Galaten 4,9, spune Sfântul Apostol Pavel. Cunoașterea teologiei creștine are ca finalitate descoperirea adevărului despre Dumnezeu și lucrările sale în lume, precum și împărtășirea din darul vieții veșnice. Domnul Isus Hristos a zis despre El însuși, Eu sunt calea, adevărul și viața. Nimeni nu vine la Tatăl meu decât prin mine. Dacă m-ați fi cunoscut pe mine, și pe Tatăl meu l-ați fi cunoscut. Dar de acum îl cunoașteți pe El și l-ați și văzut. Ioan 14, cu 6 până la 7 Constatăm faptul că nu ar fi posibilă cunoașterea lui Dumnezeu, fără mijlocirea Fiului Lui Dumnezeu și a Duhului Sfânt. Din experiența Sfinților și Părinților Bisericii, învățăm că teologia creștină este o aprofundare a dialogului omului cu Dumnezeu, este o trăire sfântă a credinței și este o viață religioasă practicată în comunitatea parohială sau monahală. Sfântul Vasile cel Mare spune, Cum mă voi mântui atunci? Prin credință, căci credința e suficientă pentru a ne convinge că există Dumnezeu. Dar nu ce este Dumnezeu în sinea Lui, iar El va răsplăti după cuviință celor care Îl caută. Căci în fond, cunoașterea ființei dumnezeiești constă tocmai în simțământul că ființa lui Dumnezeu nu o putem cunoaște, dar închinarea nu stă în legătură cu cât cunoaștem din ființa lui Dumnezeu, ci cu convingerea că El există, citat încheiat din Epistolele Sfântului Vasile cel Mare. Fiindcă suntem în anul omagial al rugăciunii în viața Bisericii și a creștinului 2022 în Patriarhia Română, afirmăm din nou ceea ce știm, că lucrarea rugăciunii este foarte importantă în demersul cunoașterii teologiei creștine, așa după cum se spune, teolog este cel ce se roagă și cel ce se roagă este teolog, Evagrie Ponticul. Un om al rugăciunii și al vieții duhovnicești, părintele Ilarion Felea, mărturisea, aceasta este ortodoxia, Hristos cu harurile bisericii, și cu adevărurile Evangheliei sale. Sfinții cu viețile, virtuțile, rugăciunile, cântările, învățăturile și predaniile lor. Poporul cu trebuințele lui de mântuire, cu darurile, durerile și bucuriile lui, citat din Părintele Felea spre Tabor. Totodată Părintele, Părintele Ilarion ne învață că Cine crede, se încrede în Dumnezeu, ca elevul în dascălul său și copilul în părintele său. Credința nu caută, ci vede pe Dumnezeu, oarecum îl experiază și se bucură de el ca de cea mai scumpă comoară. În credință ne întâlnim cu Dumnezeu și trăim în el. Există o cale a credinței. Calea credinței este calea cea mai scurtă și cea mai dreaptă, calea cea mai bine cuvântată pentru ajungere la Dumnezeu. Căci mai mulți oameni se întâlnesc cu Dumnezeu prin credință și prin faptele cele bune ale credinței. Din nou un citat din Părintele Ilarion. Sunt numeroase textele scripturistice și scririle Sfinților Părinții ai Bisericii, care ne arată și ne îndrumă pe calea către Dumnezeu prin cunoașterea teologiei creștine, 
texte ce le vom folosi în tratarea pe larg a studiului. Având în vedere faptul că procesul cunoașterii teologiei creștine este tratat din ce în ce cu mai multă superficialitate, cred că este nevoie de a apela tot mai mult la Sfânta Scriptură și la Sfânta Tradiție spre a aprofunda înțelegerea Cuvântului Lui Dumnezeu și în a ne împărtăși cu El. Pe calea cunoașterii teologiei creștine, mergem înveșmântați în smerenie, credință și dragoste, fără aroganță și autosuficiență. Cei 200 de ani de învățământ teologic la Arad demonstrează încă o dată că teologia ortodoxă poate fi cunoscută și deveni o cale către Dumnezeu și oameni. Mulțumesc! Mulțumim foarte mult! Mulțumim foarte mult! Adevăr foarte frumos, ne spune Preasfântul Părinte Episcop, că este o diferență între ce știm de Dumnezeu și ce credem de Dumnezeu. Și, într-adevăr, este o cunoaștere care premerge credința și o cunoaștere care se naște din credința Dumnezeu. Bineînțeles că, la sfârșitul acestei sesiuni, veți putea adresa întrebări, comentarii. Este o, o rezervat un timp pentru aceasta, aproape am o jumătate de oră, dacă ne înscriem noi în program, dar văd că deja suntem uh, bine. Următorul, uh, după programul nostru, este domnul Părintele Profesor, Sergei Ostianski, de la New York, de la Mary's College, Orthodox in America in its role in social flourishing, și Orthodox in America și rolul ei în florirea societății. Uh, dear professor, welcome, the floor is yours. Father uh, Nikolai, dear colleagues, Fathers, thank you so much. I'm honored and um, I would like to say a few words about uh, the significance and role of theology uh, in uh, today's modern American society. Um, orthodoxy in America is tiny, yeah, it's kind of marginal, it's on the fringes. Yeah? Um, we're not big, we're not one of the main stream um, sort of denominations. That being said though, I should also say that our cultural outreach is quite significant. Um, Now, since we are marginalized in America, um, we may kind of expect that um, it will be quite hard to carry on our missionary outreach and um, sort of uh, our vocation will be in some ways uh, minimized to the, to the extent of being completely invisible. And yet that is not the case. There's one particular facet of Orthodox tradition that has been received uh, in America uh, with great um, sort of um, favor, so to say, uh, appreciation, so to say. And I would like to say a few words about this so-called uh, the Jesus prayer tradition. Uh, it has multiple names, prayer of the heart, the noetic prayer. Uh, we also call it uh, hesychasm or hesychastic tradition. And that tradition is uh, very ancient. So just Let me give you a bit, uh, like, let me try to spell out uh, things through uh, historically contextualizing some elements of Christian uh, development. In the fourth century, Gregory Nazianzus and Basil the Great, during the 
second phase of uh, this great Origenian controversy, decided to in some ways save the legacy of origin by um, sort of um, taking the best uh, the way they understood of that which was the best of him. And that was his exegesis, right? And they've kind of invented a new genre of uh, theological thought, which was called philo the philokalia, right? Which means good stuff, yeah, it's good stuff, yeah? There's nothing bad about it. So, and uh, like fortunately, um, uh, we did not lose uh, Evagrius' uh, treatises and they were kind of ca uh, carried down to us uh, quite successfully. But the same uh, basically occurred in some ways with another tradition, tradition of the prayer, yeah? Um, whereas origin uh, was um, kind of compromised because of his theology, because of his Christology, because of his soteriology, right? He could have been condemned and therefore certain facets of his thought were kind of uh, uh, Basil and Gregory tried to rescue from being, from fading away from history. But another tradition of prayer was as controversial as uh, origins thought. And that was precisely this uh, tradition of uh, prayer of the heart, or the Noetic prayer, or uh, the Jesus prayer. Um, the reason was that most of its major protagonists were non-orthodox or ecumenically condemned and anathematized theologians like Evagrius of Pontus, right? Or some other very significant theologians who were, so to say, um, they did not belong to the mainstream uh, Chalcedonian orthodoxy like Isaac of Nineveh, right? You know, some members of the, you know, Jacobite or even like Nestorian tradition, yeah? Uh, and yet they've come up with this great monumental work on spirituality, right? And the later generations in a similar fashion decided to rescue that tradition, yeah? By naming it good stuff, yeah? Let's just, instead of dumping everything in the... Uh, kind of garbage being uh, shredding everything. Let us save it so that we can preserve that good stuff for generations to come, yeah? Um, later, that tradition was properly edited, so we've received uh, in the 17th century proper critical editions of it, and uh, one of the great Romanian uh, spiritual writers, Paisi Velichkovsky, was instrumental in that. So, but I should say that that tradition was always in the fringes. It was always marginal. Uh, there were some number of, uh, th uh, there was a number of reasons be behind uh, that. First of all, I mean, again, it's um, link with some people like Evagrius, right? Uh, second of all, um, people just couldn't uh, immediately wrap up their mind about the essence of that tradition. What is that all about? Is he here? The ancients, or like late antique thinkers, immediately noticed that it sounds quite similar uh, to kind of our approaches uh, um, the notions of apatheia and ataraxia that you know were used quite extensively in classical and late antique philosophical tradition, right? But they became very curious. What is it about? Is it a kind of um, feeling or emotion that accompanies some sort of virtuous action, similar to the stoic apatheia, right, that makes us dispassionate, a stoic sage, fully discerning his own kind of place in the fabric of beings and being uh, able to identify his own prosopon and his own kind of mask 
in this cosmic scale theatrical play written by God so as to be fully content and happy and to feel himself as if he were the creator of all this cosmos. Or perhaps this isihia, this silence or calmness or quietude is something similar to the Epicurean, let's say, ataraxia, something that constitutes the very essence of pleasure, a state of being blessed, a state of being godlike. Perhaps Epicurus would say that he was uh, the proponent of this exemplary model uh, of um, kind of um, human existence. So you should look after the gods. And the gods are such that we cannot act upon them. Yeah? They are fully frozen in this blessed contemplative repose. They don't care about us, and they cannot, because they cannot take a pause from this contemplative repose, yeah? So as to dive into our miserable and insignificant endeavors, right? Epicurus would say that, no, we must be like the gods, right? We must attain the state of contemplative ataraxia, freedom from any turbulence, of any thing that can deprive us of inner calmness and tranquility, right? Has a here, maybe it's something that supervenes upon some deep spiritual experience. Well, that was all left kind of open, yeah? Now, the tradition was also quite, um, we would say, counterintuitive and self-contradictory, right? This imageless, unceasing prayer. What does that mean? We pray always um, with uh, some help of uh, internal phantasms, right? Some inner imageries. We need to visualize our prayer. Imageless prayer is a self-contradictory notion. And a prayer which is unceasing is also self-contradictory. Because no human contemplative activity can be continuous in the sense of being uninterrupted. Only the gods can do that, yeah? That's how the ancients understood that. How can you pray without images? How can you have this continuous, unceasing, uninterrupted prayer? Oh, wow, that's one thing. Secondly, um, in our tradition, prayer is always transactional in some ways, yeah? I pray. And I ask, I supplicate, this the whole notion of supplication. I ask favor from God, yeah? God, please do it for me, yeah? I will try to kind of equalize that, make this transactional relation equitable, at least by being a good human being. But I promise, perhaps, something else, something more, right? But this prayer is non-transactional. We don't really ask anything. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. It's indefinite. Who are the us? It's unclear. You, I, someone else, yeah? It leaves it open. Indefinite, indeterminate, yeah? We ultimately do not supplicate, we do not send petition out there, right? Oh, wow, it's very interesting. Yeah? What is it all about? So then, another interesting thing is that um, if you think of that tradition, it re refers to the heart. And the heart is a seat of emotions. Yeah? But also it's this noetic, and nous is the um, summit of uh, uh, the intellect, or human intellectual activity, right? It's that which is non-discursive, kind of contemplative in us. Yeah? 
Um, but as such, it's, uh, it represents ju it's just the opposite of uh, emotional and kind of intuitive, like, life of our heart. But yet, we even learn that ultimately this prayer tradition kind of overcomes the mind and goes way above and beyond the mind so that we can reach this ultimate non-intelligible union with God and to become like God, yeah? So in some ways it combines the opposites, right? In some ways it's self-contradictory. In some ways it's counterintuitive. You just cannot do that, yeah? Without images, without phantasms, continuously, etc., etc. This brings me to my main point. This theology was incohesive in the first place. And I think, like at this point in my, of my, in my life, that theology must not be cohesive, right? Okay? As soon as it becomes fully cohesive and geometrical or mathematical, it loses its spiritual foundation, yeah? It does not mean that uh, theology or kind of uh, any spiritual thought uh, must be completely irrational, far from that. And yet, it's not premised upon some foundational laws of discursive reasoning, so to say. It's very interesting. Yeah? It kind of over overrides those laws of identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle, whatever, sufficient reasoning, like, you know, just name it, okay? But this was very interesting. Okay, I think I mumbled too much. Uh, uh, do I still have? Okay, so this tradition in some ways was also um, viewed with suspicion because, um, like, think about it. You become a monk. You, in some ways, fully assimilate yourself to God's life, yeah? You become like God. This is this kind of idea of theosis, right? Through this contemplative prayer. But in that sense, a monk does not need any traditional liturgical, sacramental kind of, you know, ritual means. It can, technically speaking, bypass them. What's the role of, uh, I don't know, catechesis, liturgy, sacraments, and things like that, right? If you can just uh, uh, dive yourself in this contemplative experience and uh, basically attain salvation, bypassing all traditional kind of steps and that kind of ecclesiastical hierarchy and then this ritual and sacramental experience, right? <laughs> something strange about all that. But in any case, this tradition um, became kind of more a uh, hard sort of uh, issue in orthodoxy in the 14th century during the Palamite controversy, right? And Palamas kind of gave it a more, I mean, orthodox rendering, yeah? Um, and yet, it's still, it's um, basically uh, used to reside, reside in monasteries, some kind of spir spiritual uh, uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, recreational centers, some like uh, margins, yeah? I, I did not know anything about that up until I started practicing it in New York. Um, so what happened was that um, in New York and in America in general, um, this tradition uh, was introduced um, approximately in the 1950s, I would say. Uh, and it was, mm, roughly speaking, uh, it came from kind of dif in different sort of uh, uh, streams or directions. One was through some big uh, writers, literators, like Salinger, yeah, who in his friend and Zoe presented this young Jewish girl practicing this contemplative prayer, yeah, in the most the strangest way. Why? 
and basically finding peace with herself, with her family, with the whole world, right? Uh, because uh, he read uh, the story of the, the pilgrim story and kind of was quite fascinated, but also, and perhaps even more so through Father Saphronius from Essex, yeah, who was for a long time on Mount Elsus and he uh, um, kind of uh, attended to uh, Saint Siloan and after, you know, came back or, you know, moved to America and so he wrote some treatises on uh, prayer and um, so uh, they were extremely influential. And gradually that tradition basically traveled to America in a very, again, strange uh, way. So, um, traditionally, since the time of Evagrius and on, like through all the great ascetics and Simeon the New Theologian and Gregory, the Jesus prayer tradition was considered to be the summit of spiritual life, the end point, yeah? You're not even allowed to say the words unless you kind of fully purify yourself, cleanse yourself of anything accretions that do not belong, do the psalmody for decades, and only then you move to this prayer tradition. But in America, in some marvelous ways, I guess following that uh, tradition from Essex, right, it was introduced rather as the starting point. Yeah, it was like some interesting reversion of, you know, beginnings and ends. It's like you go out for dinner and, you know, you expect to start with a starter, but you start with the dessert, right? Hmm. Does it make sense? Well, sometimes it works, yeah? And basically, that's what happened, yeah? In Essex and then in New York, we, I mean, priests, monks started offering this tradition not as the summit or kind of culminating climactic point of uh, spiritual development, but as the very beginning, yeah, I kind of can attract people, yeah, and sort of function to, as a tool to foster spiritual and uh, ecclesiastical outreach. Uh, we used to perform it in the strangest sense. It's Imageless, and yet we used to do it in front of the images, lights and candles, you know, it must be unseasoned, and yet we're half an hour, period, right? The funniest and strangest way, I mean, way of doing things, and yet it worked, yeah? So, I mean, I, uh, I succeeded Father John McGuckin as a priest, and uh, um, so he was the one who brought that tradition to Columbia University and Union Theological Seminary and introduced it as the starting point of spiritual kind of uh, conversion for a lot of people. And we basically have converted a lot of um, Muslims and Chinese and the Jews and like people who came to orthodoxy through this prayer tradition from some non-orthodox faith, right? I mean, I still remember people like from the Jewish theological seminary attending to it. I should say just um, one um, little remark that in New York, largely because of the post-World War kind of uh, reassessment of uh, the Holocaust by the Jewish communities, yeah? This kind of spiritual landscape was altered, and uh, a new kind of thing, such as dual belonging, the triple belonging, came into being, right? So the idea that you can be kind of, in some ways, eclectic or diverse in your spiritual kind of uh, outlook, that you can be, be a Jew and yet do like uh, Christmas, you know, celebrations, or be a Jew and be also a Buddhist, and, or, you know, I mean, I have. Roman Catholic priests in New York who are Roman Catholic priests and Buddhist monks, right? <laughs> you know? It's kind of religious eclecticism, but yet um, it functioned instrumentally as it opened up, you know, some and created very special receptivity to other traditions, right? For, you know, all the Americans of that time. And in some ways, they became open to, oh, wow, this is something wonderful. This is some, something new. And so 
what used to be marginal and what remains marginal in orthodoxy, yeah, became the mainstream in America. What used to be the summit, the ultimate culmination of your spiritual ascent when you climb this ladder of spiritual ascent and make, you know, that leap all the way to God, who all of a sudden became just a starting point, yeah? And I think that this was the main uh, input, at least in the 20th century, of Orthodox tradition in general, yeah? The input to uh, enhance, in some ways, spiritual well-being of the Americans, right? Because a lot of people are simply not well. I mean, you can smoke weed, you know, like the modern ways of overcoming any anxiety, right? Just go and get your weed. Or go get your meds, you know, like some anti antidepressant, yeah? Okay, it works for, you know, a couple of days or so, but ultimately it frustrates the purpose, right? You cannot heal a spiritual wound with some kind of, you know, like substance, yeah? It must be also spiritual. And in this case, something very extreme, something that comes from God, something that is rooted in the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, but not, not that discursive word of which we think the word premised on some foundational kind of logical principles and things like that, not the real word, the word of God that is above and beyond a kind of finite human intellect, right? That which is infinite and divine. So, and I would say that that particular tradition made the greatest impact in kind of uh, overall societal flourishing and well-being and kind of spiritual well-being in America, as I understand it at this point. Thank you very much. I think I kind of uh, spoke to you. Mulțumim foarte mult pentru această excepțională cursiune în tradiție și în, în actualitate americană. Foarte interesant. Domnul profesor, dacă îmi de două minute, că ar fi până să... așa. Um, adică din tradiție, pentru că a punctat momentele în care s-a putut forma și păstra această tradiție a rugăciunii și cu controversa originistă și Sfântul Grigore teologul și Sfântul Axelie cel Mare au realizat că trebuie menținut ce este bun de la origen, și localia, și rugăciunea, și ceilalți părinți pe care, venind până la Paisie Vecicovski, care, după cum știm, era în slavon cultul, era în latină teologia, a fost nemulțumit de ce era acolo în Ucraina și a venit în țările la noi și, iată, a contribuit atât de mult la această renaștere și părintele de la Sibiu, părintele profesorii, că vorbește mult și s-a specializat și ne-a dat cărțile minunate din care putem afla toată această istorie. Foarte interesant ce ne spuneți cu Epicur, care se puteau confunda lucrurile, nu? Ataraxia, cu omul voia să aibă o viață așa, fără turbulențe, liniște, să se asemene cu Dumnezeu. Isihia, găciunea neîncetată și foarte frumos ne-a zis domnul profesor, părintele profesor, că aparent sunt lucruri contradictorii, pentru că cum poate fi găciunea și fără imagini, și fără și neîncetată, și, uh, și a inimii care e baza e sediu sentimentului și a minții. Uh, și părintele profesor, mă bucur, este părintele profesor Tofană, la noi s-a tradus unul corinteni, noi avem Acolo e nun al lui Hristos, a tradus gândul lui Hristos și chiar o să vă rog, dacă când vom avea, poate ne explicați de ce s-a tradus cu gândul lui Hristos și nu s-a tradus, că în, în, în acuzativ noi avem mintea lui Hristos, zice Sfântul Apostol Pavel. Deci toate acestea, vedeți, foarte frumos, Părintele le-a... Și într-adevăr, de ce? Pentru că teologia, de fapt, nu e geometrie, nu, nu sunt lucrurile așa simetrice și din, și din potrivă au paradoxul lor și călugărul care vrea să intre tot Grigore Palama. Apoi, încheie într-un minut, cum, cum aceste lucruri, care înseamnă de fapt o culme a spiritualității, rugăciunea lui Iisus, 
cum în, în America a fost folosită ca un început și a prins. Și pentru părintele este ceva uh, minunat, nu? Că a fost exact uh, invers și, uh, și chiar alții, chiar de alte religii, iată, sunt atrași. Uh, acum, îmi permiteți încă o secundă că suntem în timp. Uh, eu am avut privilegiul de a, de a fi la Essex în 1991, și era în viață Părintele Sofrune, am avut șansa, deși nu știam foarte mult despre el, dar era o personalitate care ne-a copleșit imediat și uh, n-am știut asta că, iată, ce influență a avut și în Statele Unite spiritualitatea, de la Sfântul Siluan, prin Sfântul Sofronie, uh, rugăciunea uh, și, iată, închei, într-adevăr, bine spuneți că rănile spirituale nu pot fi <laughs> tratate cu substanțe. Deci, uh, și foarte frumos, foarte frumos, concluzie cum rugăciunea lui Isus chiar contribuie la o, o bună stare a americanilor care se apropie de, de aceste zaur. Vă mulțumim foarte mult pentru această excepțional, în câteva minute ați venit din trecut în, în actualitate. Mulțumim foarte mult. Uh, mi-am permis că poate s-a vorbit repede, nu știu exact cum ați reușit foarte, astăzi sunteți oricum specializați în traduceri. Uh, următorul... Uh, Uh, profesor conferențiar, adică în sensul că la conferință, părintele Porfirios Georgi, uh, pe care îl știm și am avut privilegiul să fiu de, de două ori la Balaman, după cum știți, este singura universitate ortodoxă din lume, puteți vedea site-ul, sunt vreo 12. 12, you have 12 faculties in University, Balaman University, how many faculties are 12? Or? 11. 11. Inclusiv aerospațiale, medicină și părinte de can și alții am fost prezenți acolo, a fost ne-ați copleșit și cu, spiritual, cu, și cu spiritualitatea, dar și cu ospitalitatea dumneavoastră. Absolut impresionant cum în plin război civil, patriarhul, Grigorie, patriarhul Ignatie al IV a gândit un loc în care se întâlnească tineri, un loc unde să se clădească viitorul și să fie un, absolut un campus modern și foarte, foarte... Aș vrea ca toți să, să puteți ajunge la, în acest loc minunat la Balamand, inclusiv la cedrii, care au, sunt puțini, dar tot foarte impresionant. Părintele profesor ne vorbește astăzi, care este și președintele Asociației Internaționale a Teologilor, care predau, sau profesori care predau dogmatică în lume, profesori ortodox din diversele facultăți din lume, perspective, perspectives of teaching theology in the Middle East today, the legacy of Balamand University. Deci, perspective în predarea teologiei în Orientul Mijlociu astăzi, moștenirea Balamandului. Uh, dear professor, welcome. You are for the second time in, in Arad. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for coming. Reverend fathers, distinguished colleagues, professors, beloved friends, it is a real joy uh, to be once again in Arad, in this blessed Faculty of Theology celebrating its bicentennial anniversary. I was telling some friends that 200 years of theological education should be celebrated as a church feast because we can imagine the amount of labor of effort of courage facing all difficulties in order to preserve a theological tradition in our world and in pres preserving a church witness to our world So I thank you deeply. I thank my dear colleagues, professors in Arad for inviting me to join you in this blessed celebration. The title of my paper is Perspectives of Teaching Theology in the Middle East Today, The Legacy of Balamant. Introduction. The tradition of teaching theology in Balamand was inaugurated in 1833 
when the Holy Orthodox Patriarchate of Antioch and all the East obtained an Ottoman Sultanic decree granting her the legal right to open her own seminary in the Holy Patriarchal Monastery of Our Lady of Balamant. Later on, historical circumstances that occurred during the 19th and the 20th centuries yielded a variety of challenges facing the Antiochian Church and the Balamand Seminary. These challenges have gradually consolidated our contemporary vision of theology and its role in presenting a living witness to the world today. The Antiochian school today is distinguished by two characteristics. Firstly, it carries an insightful sensitivity to the pastoral needs in our contemporary world. And secondly, it bears a spirit of openness and dialogue. As a matter of fact, even Orthodox Theological ed education is facing nowadays numerous challenges, making the need of revisiting our work in our faculties a major concern and a priority. The goal for this endeavor is to preserve and enrich theological education since it is an essential tool for serving the church. Like many other churches, Antioch faces many difficulties at the local level and in abroad. The questions that society asks today, whether ethical, scientific, or existential, and the new situations in which the faithful find themselves defy contemporary man and tempt him or her to lose faith and surrender either to atheism with its various forms or to oriental spiritualities and sects and other religious directions or complete indifference, confusion, agnosticism and alienation. A major issue that needs to be tackled is as follows. How can our academic planning, visions, teaching methods research and networking be proactive and anticipate newly arising challenges in order to put the human being in front of his or her real needs and not to fake ones. Starting from the Balaman's legacy of teaching theology and providing the church with well-equipped ministers, teachers, and scholars, I shall try today to shed light on some of the major needs and priorities of orthodox theological education in our fast changing modern world. The first subtitle in my paper is Multidisciplinary Approaches to Theology. There is no horizon of creativity and ingenuity in theology in our days without entering in a deep dialogue with the sciences of this age, exactly as the church fathers did in throughout history. The ultimate aim of this effort is to break the barriers between theology and contemporary man, or between man and the church. Theological sciences remain inapt to reach the life of man and to address his mind and consciousness if they do not open the door widely to multidisciplinary approaches, combining in their methods and tools social and positive sciences. As a matter of fact, other sciences as well as secular thought provide Christian thinking with important questions related to man, his society, his life, his needs, and his destiny. This step requires a thorough knowledge of theology, a rigorous study and training program providing the new generation of theologians with the needed background, method, and content in order to lead research and discussion in a correct direction. 
dialogue between faith and science remains unproductive if we are not deeply knowledgeable in theology and well exposed to contemporary, fast developing sciences and trends of thought. Uh, second subtitle in my paper, Institutional and Orga Organizational Specificity. Christian academic theology ought to remain a science in the service of the church. The paradigm, the paradigm of reducing theology to a branch of religious studies, the paradigm of merging theological faculties in Europe with faculties of religious studies, even in some of the most prestigious U European university renowned for their long and rich tradition of theological education should not become a model to be followed in our orthodox centers of theological education. Even though financial or administrative constraints often force institutions to refer to such policies and measures. Orthodox Theology as a genuine expression of the phronema of the church should remain clearly distinct from other valuable branches of religious studies in our universities. Our University of Balaman, for example, has much succeeded in hosting a center for religious and cultural dialogue and another center for of Christian Muslim studies as autonomous entities within the broader umbrella of the Faculty of Social Sciences. Thus, our university preserves a clear distinction between theology as the science expressing the faith we hold and other branches of religious speculation. This does not mean that the curriculum of theological studies does not necessarily include courses on other religions and dialogue with them. The third subtitle of my paper is Preserving Balance Between Theoretical and Empirical Knowledge. A major aspect of orthodox education is the holistic approach to the human existence. In the framework of educational processes, Man should be considered in the entirety of his being, namely his body, soul, mind, senses, etc. Theological institutions should be vigilant about nourishing all the dimensions of human life and activity. Thus, a major educational priority in our theological faculties is to inspire students and assist them in joining what is theoretical in theology with the lived and experienced foundation of the church faith, connecting theoretical teachings with prayer and the sacramental life as the genuine manifestation of Christ in the midst of his people. Of course, this is mostly applicable in seminaries. However, the terminology experience, the terminology experience has acquired in our days a suspicious connotation, especially in the light of the subjective spiritual experiences that, that are being spread here and there and that deviate from the genuine philokalic spirit, spirit of orthodoxy. This issue requires from our institutions a special attention and a great deal of responsibility in preparing the servants and the future teachers of the church and in training them in a spirit of discernment. We need to encourage insightful criticism, mainly self-criticism, so that the future priest and theologian may succeed in making the right decisions and in relating properly what he knows with what he lives and what he offers to his parish spiritual children students or readers. Subtitle number four, 
pastoral orientation in academic theology. We need in our pastoral studies to open the path of reconciliation between man and the church, the prodigal son and the house of the father. We also need to work for finding the means to bring back the church to inside the homes of people and to attract families to church. In order to achieve this, we must pinpoint at, at the real needs of man and the problems which challenge his life, whether on the local or the global levels. Thus, our faculties are urged to establish laboratories, workshops, and research centers that give an importance or even a priority to pastoral observation, planning, and work contributing in such a manner in defining the scope of their research activity and applied teaching. Let us mention few of the questions which require clear answers provided by our pastor pastoral workshops. Which kind of spiritual life do we need now in our societies? How do we protect today the Christian family how do we revive the participation of the believers in sacramental life? How is it possible for us to make liturgical life more dynamic, more dynamic and efficient? How can we reach those people who are far or even separated from the church? What is the role of the priest and the church in making the pastoral mission more effective? How do we grant youth and women the appropriate role they deserve in the work and life of the church? Many more are the questions with, with which each of them requires more than one conference in order to be well addressed in different socio-cultural contexts. Subtitle number five, resourcefulness and horizons of collaboration between institutions. It is not any more acceptable in our era not to benefit from the modern technical means of research, communication, and the commuting facilities for the sake of exchanging our experiences, as well as our capital of resources, databases, and references. We ought to make use of all what digital technology offers us in order to preserve information and transmit it with some academic gener generosity in conveying what we possess to others. Our faculties today cannot be content with their libraries, private collections, and human resources. There ought to exist a, spiritual, a spirit of exchange and cooperation for our work to succeed. The horizon of cooperation extends to reach possibilities of creating communication networks among faculties, whether for the sake of consulting each other, exchanging professors, students, and researchers, or organizing common workshops and common periodic conferences, which can lead through the encounter of different experience to enriching the curriculum and finding new ideas that stimulate our work and widen its horizons. Subtitle number six, research, research strategies and focuses. Our faculty's research must consider the questions, challenges, and worries of the modern mind. We ought to have in our faculty's clear policies, orientations, and visions regarding the theological needs of today. Are we asking the correct, necessary, and constructive questions? Or we are rather satisfied with these we got used to, even though they might be ineffective or irrelevant to man today? Are we capable in our researches of returning to the heart of the worries of society and to its forums which address man and civilization? or we are still stagnant and locked in a marginal state which makes of our research endeavors a superficial discourse not touching man and not capable of addressing him. We have a need to commit ourselves to the service of modern and postmodern societies, 
not to subdue man, church, and theology to these patterns of culture, but rather to penetrate into modern man's concerns, to find a way into his heart and mind, and to address his true needs, which ought to form alone the motives that define the priorities of our research. If we do so, we will be faithful to the church fathers who knew through a thorough effort of inculturation how to address and preach their epoch with the true faith. Subtitle number seven, New Educational Trends and Teaching Methods. Online theological education has imposed itself nowadays as an efficient tool in communicating theological knowledge and faith. However, we need to emphasize interactive approaches and methods of online teaching. Information is available everywhere on internet, but the experience of mentorship is the most needed priority which proved its efficiency throughout the history of Christian schools of theology. And the last point, uh, number eight, the culture of openness and dialogue. A major priority in our educational strategies in Balamand is to grant the students the opportunity of encountering a large variety of social, cultural, and religious contacts they need to be acquainted with in order to enrich the horizon of their understanding of man, man being the ultimate book of God. By acquiring a healthy religious perception of otherness as a mystery, enriching their identity and experience, students realize that theology is a call to an open dialogue with God society, and all of creation. This attitude of openness enhanced in the framework of theological studies renders the students capable of addressing their society and serving their neighbor. Students equipped with a spirit of openness and dialogue become true messengers of peace and reconciliation and bearers of hope and faith they become true vessels of the comforter spirit of God. In conclusion, responding to intellectual and moral challenges today, the most imminent challenge for our theological faculties and workshops remains the consideration of the intellectual and moral challenges of the modern and postmodern eras. We do, we do not have the right as schools of theology to deprive believers from providing accurate and clear answers to daily questions that haunt them. They need clear guidance to face today's various issues that push them to doubt the importance of their church belonging and their living of the Lord's gospel. We are urged in such a context to work together as institutions and as scholarly communities to intensify our initiatives of encounter and exchange of experiences, information, methods, and ideas in order to continuously evaluate the new experiences our society and our history are providing us with in a fast changing world. Conference like ours today in Arad should help us collaborate and create committees of continuous work and follow up. Then our initiatives shall bear fruits 30 and 60 and 100 for the glory of God. Thank you. professor. <clears throat> Scuzați că insist, dar vreau să... Deci, Balamand este singura universitate ortodoxă din lume. A fost foarte impresionant să fim acolo. Ce înseamnă să ai toate aceste facultăți care, practic, sunt ale bisericii, nu? Sunt administrate sunt ale bisericii și, într-adevăr, este un model de, de dialog și de... Îmi permit doar foarte, într-un într minut, să reamintesc aceste puncte foarte importante. Deci, primul 
și nu întâmplător cât că l-ați ales, Michel Iedea spunea că întâmplare vine din, în templu. Multidisciplin, a, a, această abordare multi sau interdisciplinară, multidisciplinară, a, este foarte importantă, într-adevăr, și încercăm și noi, a, și o să am și o posibilitate mai târziu să spun ceva despre aceasta, este foarte important, într-adevăr, să se spargă tot aceste, să se distrugă, să se treacă peste toate barierele printr-un limbaj. Da? Nu, nu la toți poate să ajungă direct limbajul teologic și atunci e foarte important și cum avem noi, de fapt, mulți absolvenți care, după cum știți, sunt la a doua facultate, fac și teologia și noi încercăm să-i stimulăm să facă și licențe și mastere și doctorate tocmai din, cu dubla lor competență, tocmai în ideea de a putea vorbi și pe altă limbă și a spune cele esențiale. Într-adevăr, sunt lucruri specifice în punct instituțional și organizatorii pentru teologie și ați insistat foarte bine să nu-și piardă teologia, facultatea, de să nu ajungă o facultate de studii religioase în care oamenii învață așa despre, fără un program, și este foarte greu, într-adevăr, astăzi să, să le menții și cursurile și slujbele și uh, să le poți și partea teoretică la punctul 3 și cea uh, de experiență. Pentru că experiența spune că poate fi câteodată suspect așa cuvântul, nu știi exact, în condițiile în care sunt tot felul de experiențe subiective. Am avut și noi tot felul pe aici, misa și alte aberații. Uh, într-adevăr, studenții trebuie orientați cum trebuie din punct de vedere pastoral, specific și insistați, și asta îmi place și chiar faceți mereu, schimbul acesta, cooperarea între facultăți este într-adevăr foarte importantă. Să nu rămână tezaurul numai acolo, mai ales cu posibilitățile noi de tehnologie, să se poată folosi cât mai mult de ce are fiecare facultate, strategii noi de cercetare, noi metode în educația teologică, pentru că într-adevăr spuneți că avem informație peste tot, problema este cum o folosim și ce experiențe autentice pot avea studenții noștri, deschidere și dialog și concluziile ați auzit și ați insistat într-adevăr pe, pe schimb și celălalt într-adevăr întotdeauna te, te îmbogățește. Părinte profesor, mulțumim foarte mult și uh, sunt sigur că vor fi întrebări și comentarii. Ultimul uh, de pe, din, din programul de acum de dimineață este distinsul domn profesor Andreas Müller, Uh, the realization of uh, philanthropy in St. John, Chrysostom, uh, deci Chris, uh, creștinarea filantropiei la Sfântul Ioan Chrysostomul. Domnul profesor vine din Germania, de la Universitatea din Kiel. Uh, welcome, dear professor, the floor is yours. Most honorable fathers, colleagues, dear students and guests, I'm very glad to participate at this conference. I came the first time to Arad uh, 30 years ago. And I see that your school, that your faculty is still flourishing, publishing a very important uh, periodical, having very good professors. And I'm glad today to celebrate 200 years of this great place of theology in Arad. I'm very thankful to Father Porfirios. Um, he uh, somehow described the frame of my lecture I'm giving now. You were speaking about well, the penetration of Christianity in our society. I will give an example uh, by uh, studying St. John Chrysostom, and I thought that John Chrysostom is a good example in Arad because he is the patron of the city. The Christianization of philanthropy in Johannes Chrysostomos. First, an introduction. When talking about the significance of theology for our contemporary society and culture, it is helpful for the church historian and patrician to take a look at late antiquity. At a time when Christianity was striving to penetrate and shape society ever more deeply, how did people manage to convey its significance for it. As is well known, Christianity has been able to make its social relevance clear, especially in the area of charity. Christians, their congregations and community leaders 
have not only offered religious alternatives to ancient religio religiosity, rather out of their religious convictions, they have reacted to social needs and tried to remedy them. In doing so, they embarked on paths uh, that were completely new in ancient society. Of central importance here is the question of how they justified their charitable actions. If one examines this question more closely, one can see that theologians certainly took up ancient patterns of charitable action, but transformed them significantly. In the following, I would like to investigate just such a transformation using the example of the apostle of charity in late antiquity, the Antiochian theologian and Constantinopolitan Bishop John called Goldmouth. For this contribution, I will leave aside the question of the exact historical location of Chrysostom's uh, individual remarks and rather attempt to trace some central ideas of his thought. In principle, the former deacon's accession uh, to the episcopate has certainly modified his concept, but not fundamentally changed it. Important impulses for today's debate on the role of the church in society can still be gained from this concept. In the following, I will concentrate primarily on the question of how John took up the ancient idea of Eugesia and transformed it into Christianity. Second, criticism of the classical Eugetai. Eugetai classically came from the upper classes of Roman society. They bestowed their favors on clients from the upper classes in order to maintain their reputation and, if necessary, also their political approval. Bread and games were often promoted, but also buildings. Above all, however, clients were also supported by patrons through donations. Chrysostom is very clear about the latter. In his 61st homily on the Gospel of Matthew, he criticizes the behavior of the landowners from whose circles the Eugetes came, in particularly harsh terms. In doing so, he focuses above all on the fact that they constantly burden the needy with taxes. Some rich people even deliberately let grain and wine spoil in order to drive up prices on the market. Therefore, Chrysostom asks the question of justice. Quotation, can there be any more unjust people than the owners of land who draw their wealth from the earth? End of quotation. Chrysostom assumes that wealth is not to be regarded as rightful property. Rather, it had been stolen at some point by one of the ancestors. Nevertheless, Chrysostom also makes more moderate statements. In his homilies to 1 Corinthians, he states that wealth actually belongs to God, but that private property is not bad. It is only bad not to give it to the poor or to use it badly. Chrysostom accordingly distinguishes between the rich and the unmerciful. Participation in the affliction of the poor is the highest honor for the benevolent supporters. Already with such statements, the church father transformed classical ideas. The rich do not receive honor by supporting their own class, but especially those who are in essential need of support. Third, the benefits of supporting those in needs. For Chrysostom, helping the needy is a merit with God. In any case, it is meritorious to give for the sake of God. If one gives to the poor, however, one cannot immediately expect a return gift from them. In the sense of classical oegotism, it made no sense to give support to needy people 
who have involuntarily fallen into poverty. Nevertheless, the ethos of wealthy people in Chrysostom's environment continued to be shaped by the practice of Eugesia. Similar to Cyprian of Carthago, Chrysostom also had to tie in with the ancient ethos on the one hand, but at the same time transpose it into a Christian system of values. In any case, ancient Eugetism was still firmly anchored even among rich Christians. Accordingly, the church father had to make it clear that even the involuntarily poor are able to make a return gift to their patrons, at least indirectly, and that they support, their support is accordingly not a one-way street for gifts that end in a deficit. Rather, thus formulated with regard to Paul's support of the saints in Jerusalem, the support of the needy is useful and noble. Indeed, the expenditure is ultimately a revenue. In any case, John states sweepingly in his Sermon on Alms, quotation, for God has appointed alms not only that the needy may be fed, but that the givers of money may also receive benefits, yea, for their sake more than for their use, uh, for the, than for those, end of quotation. Basically, Chrysostom is thinking primarily of the prayer that the poor can cultivate for their supporters. Let us explore this new orientation of Eugesia in more detail. Four, Christian versus pagan Eugesia. The transformation process of classical Eugetism becomes clear, among other things, in the 10th homily on 1st Corinthians. There, Chrysostom transfers terms that classically denote the Eugetes, sotir, evergetis, prostatis, to the Christian benefactor who helped the poor. In combination, these terms refer to a rather pagan coloring which were, however, is possible, probably deliberately adapted in a Christian way. In any case, Chrysostom sets himself very critically Astfel, apart from pagan oarism by making it clear that all boasting and all the pleasures associated with it only on robbery. The benefactors only reimburse what they have previously robbed. Chrysostom counters this with a Christian practice. In his homily 48 on the Gospel of Matthew, he accordingly calls on benefactors to make their house a church, not a theater, by showing hospitality to the needy, uh, worthy guests. Thus the devil would flee and Christ would enter with his choirs of angels. The service to the neighbors is thus understood in reference to Matthew uh, 25 as a service to God, as it were, uh, the liturgy after the liturgy, let's say. Uh, the Eugetism practiced by the Bishop of Christians accordingly took on a new form as it was characterized by a different program. Chrysostom was no longer concerned with the hollow glory of liturgies and Eugetism, but with the true glory of caritas. A good reputation among thousands is assured to the supporter of the poor anyway. In the face of such a program, Chrysostom praised the care of 3,000 widows, the visiting of prisoners and of the sick in hospital, and the provision of clothes and food to strangers. Ellen Natalie interprets institutions such as these as a war machine, as it were, against pagan oergetism, even if this was to be regarded as necessarily coexistent with Christian characters. The Church Father now particularly emphasizes the reciprocity of the relationship of giving to the involuntarily poor. It is precisely these who are greater benefit to the world. 
The benefactors are given even more fame than in classical oergetism because the oerget can be praised as father and benefactor of all, including the poor. After all, it would be a matter of admiration here, not simply a demonstration of wealth. For this very reason, a merciful benefactor and not a classical oergit is assigned attributes not only of pagan benefactors, but also of God, such as savior, and not such as miser, proud, and glutton. Occasionally, Chrysostom makes very disparaging remarks about the pagan forms of Oergesia and Philotimia, respectively contrasting them with Christian benefits. Quotation, don't you see how generous the spectators are in the theater, how much they throw out for worse, and you do not give even half as much, oft not even the least. The devil demands that you give to all kinds of people, although he can only offer you hell for it. Christ merrily demands that we give to the needy and promises us the kingdom of heaven in return." End of quotation. In the same sermon, he contrasts the politically motivated charities even more clearly with the Christian motivated ones. There he states, quotation, just take a look at the politically motivated charities. How much expenditure a single family often has to take up on itself, upon itself without further ado and does not feel, even feel the expense. If every rich man were likewise to pay a tribute for the poor, he would in a little while usurp the kingdom of heaven." End of quotation. Five arms lead to forgiveness of sins. Similar to Cyprian, Chrysostom's, uh, Chrysostomus uh, also argues with recourse to the Old Testament with the effect of arms on the forgiveness of the sins of uh, the Oergetes. Accordingly, arms giving can be called an art, techni, even the best of all arts which produces extremely useful things and thus builds dwellings in heaven. For the possibility of the forgiveness of sins, poverty in the world would be needed, which God has not eliminated even for that reason. In generally, he assumes a restitution that could already be a hundredfold here following Matthew 6:19. The prospect of the last judgment to motivate alms givings plays a, a role for Chrysostomus again and again. Thus he mentions the terrifying last day in many places. The poor virtually form an army with which they wage a battle against the devil by bringing about God's favor through their prayers. Almsgiving is thus ultimately based on the idea of acquiring true property, namely wealth in heaven, by using and not by possessing what are ultimately other people's good. I will finish here. Um, six, um, uh, almsgiving leads to theopoiesis. Chrysostom thus sees the virtuous man clearly in contrast to the one who stages his wealth in a classical way. Such adorning oneself with bold plumes, a staging on the stage with boasting are in any case useless to him as mere externals. In general, he states with regard to the ancient practice of inner world, the do ut des, that like God himself, one should not do good deeds for the sake of retribution or even repayment. The church father thus connects arms with the idea of theopoiesis, or theosis, even more strongly than can be observed in Cyprian's work. Fundamentally, he states that concern for the benefit of one's neighbor at the most perfect rule of Christianity leads to the highest summit of perfection. Christian Oyagetes becomes like God in this way, who is 
Eleemon, uh, just as the Roman emperors once did. Whoever loves resembles God in his mercy and long suffering, and accordingly, he also demanded in Ephesus, uh, Ephesus uh, 5 1, resembles him. Conclusion Are Chrysostom's insights still relevant in modern society? In several respects, they certainly are. Chrysostom's insights are based on general human thinking, as already expressed in ancient Oyagesia. If I do something, I want to receive something in return. But he warns against fixating on earthly recognition and the ever-increasing accumulation of earthly goods. In transforming the classical Oyagesia model, John rather admonishes that the struggle for happiness and contentment should be about more than in pagan oergetism. He stretches the classical thought patterns into a transcendent and eschatological framework. It is about achieving true respect, freedom from burden of sins, and ultimately perfection. This makes it possible for those poor people to be considered through Eugesia who were not the focus of human activity until late antiquity. Chrysostom is convinced that human beings receive the power of creation from God in order to make more out the earth than just a materially conceivable world, namely heaven on earth. For the church father, the place where such metamorphosis is already happening is paradigmatically the church. If it promotes awareness of such values, it still makes a contribution to society and its culture today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mulțumim foarte mult, eu să mă, mă abțin să mai comentez prea mult, că, dar suntem aproape bine cu timpul, doar mulțumim foarte mult și uh, domnului profesor pentru această expune excelentă și ne-am dat seama că exista filantropie, dar creștinismul i-a dat al sens, e vorba de oamenii uh, săraci în mod involuntar, care trebuie ajutați într-adevăr și practic cel bogat, Până la urmă dă înapoi ce s-a luat la un moment dat de el sau de alții în mod nedrept. Până la urmă bogăția este într-adevăr al Dumnezeu. Știm ce se întâmplă astăzi, cam cât la sută din populație uh, are aproape tot ce e pe terra. Pau Pari, spuneați că este un impact și actualitate. Într-adevăr, pauperizarea aceasta care a început și care nu știm până unde va merge și ce se va întâmpla cu noi este doar în început. Și va fi nevoie, într-adevăr, să, să spunem mereu că, într-adevăr, cei milostivi uh, vor fi ca Dumnezeu, adică a fi milostiv înseamnă a semăna cu Dumnezeu și ne gândim și chei uh, și la titorii de aici, Simeon și Efiginie, Asina, am înțeles că erau mai ce de român, cum ce viziune au avut să doneze terenul, să, adică oameni care, uh, titorii aceștia mari, care dădeau și titoreau de fapt, și prezentul, dar mai ales viitor. Vă mulțumim foarte mult. Avem în jur de 22 de minute, nu? De discuții. Vă rugăm frumos. Cine vrea să... Părinte profesor, vă rugăm frumos. Sau cine a ridicat primul mâna? Da, poftim. Părinte profesor... Aș dori să mulțumesc părintelui, părintelui Serghei Trostianski pentru această prezentare atât de frumoasă despre rugăciunea lui Isus în special. Eu personal am scris o carte despre rugăciunea lui Isus cu câțiva ani înainte și am gândit când am scris cartea despre rolul terapeutic 
dacă putem spune așa, terapeutic al societății care este înglodată de consumerism și de care e foarte, s-a depărtat de la Dumnezeu, sigur, prin mai multe astfel de practici. Și am zis, rugăciunea lui Isus poate să fie o modalitate terapeutică de vindecare a, a, a minții, de purificare a minții umane. Eu, și cred și acum tot la fel și chiar o încercare de însănătoșire a societății, chiar din punct de vedere medical, să știți. Ceea ce pe mine m-a impresionat este faptul cum rugăciunea lui Isus a, a fost receptată de către societatea americană. O societate bogată, spunem noi, o societate de la care am primit multe lucruri bune, dar și mai puțin bune. Trebuie să spunem aceasta cu toată dragostea creștinească și frățească. Și eu aș pune o următoare întrebare. Rugăciunea lui Isus, nu știu cum este, eu am fost în America odată, dar bine, să fii odată în America, stai o lună, e prea puțin să înțelegi din mentalitatea americană. Aș vrea să pun în următoarea întrebare. Rugăciunea lui Isus și urmările rugăciunii lui Isus implică o purificare morală în societate sau e privită rugăciunea lui Isus ca o un fel de, să zicem așa, modalitate de spiritualizare a omului, care nu întotdeauna implică și o schimbare morală profundă. Cei care au, deci, au primit deci, rugăciunea lui Isus, au fost, cred eu, și entuziasmați, îmi pot imagina acest lucru, oare s-a produs această transformare morală? Cât de cât, sigur, noi tot păcătuim și tot cădem, dar încercăm să ne căim de păcate și să facem voia lui Dumnezeu. Deci, încă o dată spun, e rugăciunea lui Isus în America doar ca și o modalitate oarecum exoterică, frumoasă, care te gâdele la urechi, să mă iertați de expresie, și care rămâne o modalitate, un fel de yoga modern, hai să spunem așa, pai pe înțelesul nostru, ea are implicații morale în societatea americană. Asta ar fi pentru dumneavoastră, iubite părinte. Pentru uh, uh, domnul profesor Müller ar fi alt, altă, o precizare doar, uh, legat de Sfântul Ioan Gură de Aur. Uh, Sfântul Ioan Gură de Aur, spun, nu, nu știu exact locul unde, vă pot trimite pe e-mail dacă vreți. Eu am ascultat cu atenție ce ați spus dumneavoastră aici, n-am auzit că ați, ați menționat, n-am auzit să fi menționat dumneavoastră, sigur, într-o conferință nu poți spune totul, spui cât poți, cât îți permite și timp, spațiu. Sunt eu Gură de Aur, spunea la un moment dat, zice, a avea grijă de cei săraci, a te identifica cu cei săraci, adeseori înseamnă mai mult decât a învia morții. Cel care se implică în și trăiește drama săracului, este superior chiar celui ce al învia un mort. Pe mine m-a impresionat această expresie și aș putea să vă comunic de unde, de unde, nu știu dacă noi o comentar la epistola întâia către Corinteni, nu știu dacă, după, dacă memoria nu mă înșală. Nu mă am vrut să spun pentru frumusețea conferinței dumneavoastră, care a fost minunată, foarte frumos, felicitări. Și una a fost frumoasă și cealaltă. Vă mulțumesc! Mulțumim foarte mult, profite profesor! Um, <coughs> Father Mekeshan, thank you so much and now I'm very curious to read your book and uh, if it has not yet been translated into English, perhaps, you know, you should, or we should of combine our effort and yes because this is very important and uh, basically this is the essence of what I try to deliver and uh, I mean it goes right to the heart of the issue um, at hand so um, I would say that um, remember how during the time of communism right religion was kind of um, not politically correct yeah. And, uh, but you cannot get rid of a spiritual human being, right? So, and that's why uh, 
all encounters were kind of a bit strange, a bit awkward, right? Not properly mediated through the church and its you know, sacraments, its ritual, but kind of used to hit people in the, mo in the strangest, unmediated way. And prayer was a good medium for that. So, and it's the same situation now, like in America, for instance. I mean, the, the traditional religion is not politically correct. Um, why so? Well, I mean, you know, because it's, um, I don't know, patriarchal, uh, misogynist, homophobic, you can name it, yeah? So, and in some ways, people are kind of discouraged from participating in that kind of traditional way. But the Jesus prayer tradition somehow allows them to at least to make the first move so that they can then proceed with more like a traditional, you know, catechesis and theology and liturgy. And that's how we understand it. And that ultimately, I mean, perhaps at first it's a mere kind of this indefinite quest of, for spirituality of some kind of yoga type and things like that. But ultimately, it opens up this path to a genuine orthodox theology and ritual and liturgy, and I think it ultimately uh, allows uh, a person to basically, basically climb the ladder of ascent, so to say, to a very authentically spiritual orthodox ethos. So I would guess that. But I would like to read your book. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Read the Professor Sorry. Yeah, thank you so much for this additional remark. I, I had to shorten my paper from 35 pages to just eight. So I didn't mention everything. but. I would be very glad to to have this um, th this um, uh, quotation of uh, John Chrysostom uh, um, according to resurrection and um, and uh, caring poor uh, caring care for the poor. It's, that's great. Mutsumask. the professor Tofano professor So don't professor Okay, I would also have one question, one question or two questions for Professor, for Professor Sergei. First of all, um, really appreciation and many thanks for your really interesting and very interesting paper presentation. The first question, you have mentioned in your presentation two kinds or two ways of prayer. The prayer with the mind and the prayer with the spirit. And these two kinds or two ways of prayer are mentioned by Paul, Apostle Paul, in uh, his first epistle addressed to Corinthians, chapter 15. I will pray with my mind and I will pray with my spirit. And when we don't know what we have to ask, or, or, or what we should demand from God, the Spirit is coming to help our weakness. My question is, could you give us a little bit more details what means for you, for instance, this prayer with mind and the prayer with the Spirit what means for the Christian today, for instance, in America, nowadays, to pray with mind? This is the first question. And the second question um, refers to the definition of prayer. We know in almost uh, spiritual works and theology, the prayer is defined as being a dialogue between man and God. I don't agree with this 
definition. For me personal, the prayer is not a dialogue. Why? Because a dialogue presupposes two partners. I ask something, I say something, you ask, or you give me an answer, and so on and so forth. This is the dialogue, logically. But uh, when we pray with God uh, or before God, uh, we are not in dialogue with Him because He doesn't respond immediately to our demands. Maybe He will uh, give, a, give us a response tomorrow or next week or next year and so on and so forth. For me personally, prayer means a position, positioning of ourselves in mind and spirit before God. And an example in this regard is the prayer of mother of Samuel in Old uh, Testament, mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 1. Do you agree all my statements with regard to the prayer, what means prayer, for instance? Thank you very much. Uh, dear Father, Professor, thank you so much. I mean, like, your uh, speech was very uh, profound, and I agree with everything you said, basically. Uh, so just briefly, um, uh, the first question uh, about the meaning of this noetic prayer, right? Um, and what we can make out of that. And I agree with you that... Um, I guess theologically and philosophically, the meaning of this noetic is uh, kind of non-discursive, right? Intuitive grasp of some primary constitutive uh, elements of reality. In this case, of God and of God's maybe will for us, yeah? Um, it does not run through the media of, uh, you know, the premises and through some inferences and conclusions, right? It's unmediated. And uh, I guess in that sense, uh, uh, noetic uh, in some ways corresponds with spiritual because what if not uh, a spirit in us that kind of runs in some strange, mysterious, intuitive, kind of non-discursive, non-mediated ways. So in this case, I totally agree with you that uh, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians basically testifies to that. And uh, thank you so much. I mean, this was like, you know, I mean, right to the point. And um, the second thing, um, mm, your second question uh, as dialogue yes um uh, again uh, it looks like um, you basically uh in your talk uh, fully encapsulated that uh the essence of this uh tradition the way i understand it right that it's not transactional, yeah? Uh, it's not I give you this and you give, give me that in return. It's not premised on the principles of the legal and the equitable. It's not therefore premised upon the principles of justice, yeah? Uh, and uh, we don't really ask for anything from God. Right, but we somehow gradually, I guess, assimilate our mind and the whole life to God's life, and uh, we don't expect anything in return, right? And uh, again, like, um, I totally agree with you that it cannot be framed into, uh, um, like, our liturgical prayer, let's say, model, right? Litanies, prayer, supplication, you know, 
requests, you know, please God, grant me this, you know, favor, yeah, give me a favor. I would like this and this and that. And we always ask for peace, prosperity, well-being, for being excluded from all the turbulence and being saved, preserved for the family and things like that. Whereas the ultimate like uh, prayer of which you spoke, that Jesus prayer, it kind of, yeah, I guess goes above and beyond that. Thank you very much. I truly enjoyed it. Mulțumim foarte mult. Mi s-a transmis din nou că la fără 10 cel târziu să ieșim, că ne așteaptă și ierarhii pe cei care sunt invitați la masă de prânz de la hotel. Poate chiar așa ceva foarte scurt, așa sunt părinte de can. Aș dori să mulțumesc în primul rând celor patru conferențiari. Veniți vă pentru că aduce de vă. Care ne-au prezentat niște referate extrem de valoroase și captivante și doresc să le mulțumesc personal în mod deosebit. Dar pentru că timpul presează, o scurtă întrebare Părintelui Profesor Porfirios. Ați amintit de școala teologică de la Balaman, pe care am avut bucuria ca împreună cu mai mulți teologi să o cunoaștem face to face și ne-a încântat. Ați putea să ne spuneți cam care este procentul absolvenților dumneavoastră care îmbrățișează preoția și slujirea preoțească, cam cât sunt cei care sunt integrați în învățământul religios, dacă se practică, și e, cât se îndreaptă spre alte domenii. Și a doua, în ce măsură e, cultivați dialogul interreligios cu musulmanii, pentru că locuiți într-un mediu e, imprimat, de, și de religia islamică. Și cum se derulează, care este receptivitatea acestui dialog, pentru că tot vorbi, veni vorba de dialog. Și în legătură cu problematica dialogului, aș dori puțin să nuanțez alături și eu părintelui profesor Serghie. Dacă înțelegem dialogul pur uman, spun ceva, îmi răspuns, iarăși răspund, sigur că nu putem vorbi de acest dialog între, sau de această convorbire a omului cu Dumnezeu. Dar dacă eu mă așez înaintea lui Dumnezeu ca o realitate personală, vie, care mă ascultă, că îmi răspunde acum, peste o lună, peste cinci ani, este mai puțin relevant. Este important să am această conștiință că mă aflu în fața lui Dumnezeu, ca în fața unei realități vii, personale, nu ne abstracțiuni și cu care chiar pot avea acest, să nu-i zic dialog, să nu înțelegem greșit, acest schimb, să zicem, de energie, de putere, mi se pare că poate fi în acest sens înțeles. Desigur, dacă îl înțelegem, cum a spus, în sensul acesta, vorbesc, îmi răspuns, sigur că nu, nu se poate vorbi, dar cred că un pic trebuie să nuanțăm. Da. Uh, would you like to? Yes. Well, I, I would like to say something about our yes. As you you asked Father Tulkan, uh, you asked about our uh, alumni. How many of them are committed to the church life and church service? Well, as you know, our faculty. Uh, In, in our faculty, we have students from the entire area of the Middle East, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, Arab countries, Arab-speaking countries. And we also have students coming from Antiochian parishes, parishes in the diaspora, whether Latin America, Australia, North America, and even Europe. Most of our students, most of them, come after having completed other university studies. So we have, uh, we have uh, medical doctors, engineers, uh, lawyers, people from different uh, disciplines coming and joining uh, a four-year program of undergraduate studies with the possibility of master's degree and PhD if they want to continue. So. 
all these people usually come with a sense of vocation, desiring to join the service of the church. And usually more than 90% of our students, yes, do become priests or monks, uh, which is very important for us, actually. But we, we definitely try to deal with them with the spirit of freedom, not uh, making them feel that because they came to Balaman, they have to, to become priests. Uh, we, we consider, their, and they consider their period of studies as also a period of exploring the reality of serving the church. And we try as much as we can to put them in contact with the reality of serving the church, with all the prob problems, all the difficulties, all the conflicts, and all complications. And in this way, they are well equipped when they graduate to really go stand still wherever they have to be and give a witness and be solid in their conviction and in their mission. Concerning dialogue and dialogue with Islam in our area, dialogue with Islam is not always easy because, uh, because Muslims always consider that they are a superior religion and they tend to uh, refuse categorically our faith in the Holy Trinity, in the cross of our Lord, in the resurrection of Christ. Our experience is always in giving them a witness that Christian faith is more logical than they think. That the, the reality of the triune God is more pertinent to a true concept of divinity than a one unique individual person of God. And also we try to show them from their text, from the Quran and their tradition, that the death of Christ and his resurrection and his, his divine nature have, have always inspired their religion also and enriched their faith. As a matter of fact, uh, dialogue with, with Islam is a cross. It is our cross in our area, but like any cross, it's a life-bearing cross and a cross leading to joy, to resurrection, and to union with God. Thank you. Mulțumim foarte mult. O să spunem cu bine se poate pe astăzi. Și programul îl avem, dar pentru cine nu are programul, cum mai este pauza de prânz, iar lucrările vor fi reluate și aici, fizic, dar și online. Aici, la 15.40, începe sesiunea moderator Părintele Profesor Ștefan Buchiu și Părintele Ioan Tulcan, Părintele Profesor. 15.40, trebuie să fim din nou aici, da? Poftim și paralel online. Numele Tatălui și al Fiului și al Sfântului Duhan. Cuvine se cu adevărat să te fericim pe tine născătoare, Dumnezeu, cea pururea fericită și prea nevinovată ca Dumnezeului nostru, ceea ce ești mai există cât heroviimii și mai mărită pe de asemănare. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. God have mercy, God have mercy, God have mercy, Father, give the best. Ayuh al-Masih, ilahuna, anta barik, ishtima'ana, wahfazna, wa kun ma'ana, wa kun khadiran bainana. وبارك كل واحد من الحاضرين وقدس حياته ونفسه لخدمة مجدك آمين. آمين. Thank you very much. مصمم تطور دوام نجوت السنة بدم كبينة فماسم. دا كشتي لسفي انسبات دوسنا.
you very much. Presenting us. Thank you very much. Where shall we leave this? Um, I think just on the table. Oricine prea... Cine prea oare ăstea... Poftim? Poftim? Da. Noi avem mintea lui Hristos. Da, ca inteligență, ca intelect, da. Nu ca organul unirii mistice. Exact. Asta e problemă. Organul unirii mistice. Pavel, cum vă trebuie să devin că înțelege rațiune, nu înțelege aminte că înțelege mâine acum. Da. De ce că noi avem mintea, noi avem nu unul Corinten 2, 16, cu gândul. De ce cum am tradus? Să scăpiți să vorbim. Oh, yes, practic. Just one second. 